Hello, everybody, and welcome to the live FIGEF Wine Talk. My name is Wolfgang Junglers. I'm the president of FIGEF, the International Federation of Wine and Spirit Journalists and Writers, and I will be the host of our 45 minute wine talk today. Our subject is wine tourism actual and future challenges for the wine tourism in the world. Our speakers are FIGEF members from different continents Liz Palmer from Canada. Alejandro Paidin from Spain, Nathalie Said Juma from Lebanon, and Filippo Magnani from Italy. Every speaker will share with us some interesting information from his region. At the end of the wine talk, you will all have the opportunity to ask questions. We are starting with Liz Palmer. Liz, you are a journalist, award winning author, global wine influencer, president of Les Dames d'Escovier, Ontario, Canada and founder of Women and Wine Talks. You live in Canada. Please tell us about wine tourism in Canada pre and post COVID-19. I'm gonna share the screen. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, I'm extremely proud and honored to participate in today's first speech of talks alongside Wolfgang, um, and today's moderator and three other uh, member speakers that have been announced. Just so you get a sense of the Canadian wine industry, here's a, a brief overview. Uh, the Canadian wine, in, uh, wine growing region is situated in the growing zones of 30 to 50 degrees north uh, latitude, which is shared by other cool climate wine regions in Europe. The primary wine grow growing regions are Niagara Plinza in Ontario, the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia amongst other smaller groups in um, other provinces of Quebec and Nova Scotia, which are small scale. Um, together, Canada's uh, wine growing regions are comprised of 25,500 acres of 500 wineries. Our wine economy um, is 6.8 billion uh, with 3, 000, uh, sorry, 31,000 jobs. Here's a map, here's some maps. I'll just go through from east to west. You can just get a take a look of the British Columbia zone, Quebec, Ontario, Nova Scotia, uh, going from west to east. It's the 200 year old industry, it's unlike Europe. Um, there's British Columbia, you can see the Vancouver Island, the Fraser Valley, Okanagan Valley, and other emerging regions. Um, there we go. In BC, there's 929 vineyards to let you know, and 10,250, sorry, 60 acres of planted uh, land um, with 280 licensed wineries. Uh, there's 80, 80 grape varieties per produced. There's a breakdown on the whites, the reds, and then the ratio of white to red, 49 to 51. Ontario is the second uh, growing region that's uh, quite booming. Uh, economically, it's 3.3 billion economic impact, and it's a significant driver to the interior economy. 14,000 people have jobs in Ontario, and they welcome almost 2 million visitors a year. This is pre-COVID. Um, and then, obviously, uh, $644 million in tourism, them. Uh, been, uh, this is the, the numbers we got from last year has been, uh, you know, impacted. Uh, there's the, the grape varieties that Ontario is focusing on for the reds, the whites, and as you know, it's the largest producer of ice wine uh, in the world. The eight, almost a million years. There's the grape varieties they're using. And then there's the wine regions of Quebec, or a little bit smaller. In Nova Scotia. Now, post COVID, during the Canadian wine industry, this is right now we're going through a reaction phase of the crisis. Coming from Canada. Yeah, and, and trying to manage the day to day challenges. Recovery is, recovery is just starting up, and this is going to be the main focus. This this means that there's little data on the effects of wine tourism, primarily due to pandemic. I did manage to find some key points and stats on British Columbia wine industry, not on the uh, Ontario wine industry and the others. I've got these from uh, other researchers that work um, in the wine industry. Um, the hospitality and tourism sectors can 
anticipate a painful uh, contraction uh, with uh, losses between 6 billion to 10 billion provincially. This is only one province. Um, and then in BC alone, and then there's the Okanagan Valley is separate. They've given me two different numbers, which is 393 million to uh, 1.2 billion in the Okanagan Valley. The jobs losses could range from 130,000 to 193,000. Um, in BC and Okanagan is uh, 9,700 to 14,700. Now, these external factors also are contributed to, to slow muted recovery, uh, prolonged cl uh, closure to the US uh, Canada border, which is uh, our Prime Minister is very firm on this. Uh, we don't want the Americans over at this point. Um, yeah. Pardon? Should we save the question? Yeah, carry, carry on, Liz. Yeah, yeah. We'll, carry on. We'll save the questions to the end. Yeah. Uh, prolonged uh, curtailment on international air travel, of course, is going to affect it. Reluctance by Canadians to travel domestically for health and financial reasons is another factor. And protractor restrictions on gatherings. I think they're only allowing 10 group people in groups of 10 right now, including conferences, large weddings, and other family events. So right, right now, it's like, Group of groups of ten, and all the whole outlook of the hospitality of tourism for British Columbia has it looks bleak. Um, however, they have been re, re, uh, relying on cellar door sales. <laughs> I, I'm not sure, yeah, what you call that in Europe, but um, the the tourism is also looking and developing this. So they're they're working on this. They're making you know huge strides on cellar doors. Um, so as you can see, we've been hit real hard like everybody else. Um, but with the, what, they, what they're also doing for the recovery start plan, it to, it's called ready to, uh, ready to reopen a policy, uh, recommending health and safety guidelines, which are included. They're reducing wine, wine recovery. Liz, we can't hear you. Is that better? Yes, now it's better. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so what they're doing? So continue, please, please continue. Please, the others switch off their um, microphones, and Liz, please continue. Okay, um, well, they've, they've started a ready to open, reopen policy recommending health and safety guidelines, like I think every other country is doing the same thing, reducing um, wine, uh, winery capacity for visiting, employee training on health and safety, of course, Take, tasting room reservations only, physical distancing guideline markers, which show up on the floor and, and other things, increased sanitization and customer contact services, limiting the group booking size, there's small groups. BC Institute support, it supports the government's continued efforts to mi minimize the risk and spread, and they, and they are financially supporting them at, at, you know, at different phases. Um, so they, the BC uh, wine tourism uh, uh, approximately attracts 1 million visitors a year. With this three month shutdown, they're estimating a loss of one, between one quarter and one third, which is huge. Um, so that's uh, something they've got to you know, re reinvent. So on a positive note, they, some of the, re the hotels are filling up July and August. We've got some, uh, some uh, uh, of that. Um, I think that that suggests a rebound in visitors across Western Canada and almost certain Yagan Valley will benefit because it's starting up slowly. Um, I don't know if it's significant to salvage what is a short season, but they're going to tough it out. Um, 
and uh, hopefully they can travel open and uh, that's all we can say right now. I didn't get a lot of uh, research from um, the, the government. I did get sources from Janet Dorinsky, the trade commissioner, and Jaron Graham, who does uh, research on um, Canadian wine uh, and spirits industry, wine drops. So th this is all I can say at this point. I, I didn't get a lot, but I'm, I'm still going to gather more and continue the conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Liz. And uh, perhaps you can stop sharing the screen now so we can go back. Okay, thank you very much. So we are 25 members now. Thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us. And we'll answer questions at the end of our wine talk. So whoever has got a question to Liz, how the situation in wine tourism is in Canada, can ask this question at the end of our wine talk, which will be in around 40 minutes. From Canada, we are going to Spain, the country with the largest wine growing area in the world. Alexandro Paidin is a sommelier, trainer and food and wine journalist with experience as an international taster. Alejandro, please tell us about the situation in Spain. Uh, I guess tourism is an important economic factor in your country. Yeah, thank you for your question, uh, Mr. President. And in the next minutes, I will show you uh, any pictures that I think that can explain uh, a little how is our uh, um, tourism industry in the in the wine sector okay can you see the picture the first picture yeah yeah okay perfect um it's clear that this situation will change the horizon of the tourist sector but it doesn't necessarily have to be negative for the wine tourism in order to analyze the challenges and opportunities of the sector we should first analyze the main agents involved um, which we can specify in three, okay? And I think that it's important to analyze first the wine tourists, the target to um, identify correctly the, the, the best way to, to in, improve uh, wine tourist um, activities in our, in our uh, winery. So the tourist customers or our customers is interesting because the profile of the wine tourism consumer is very specific and has little to do with the rest of the tourists. A week ago, I attended a webinar on wine tourism in Spain, and one of the speakers summarized the profile of this customer. And the main skills that he said uh, are here in, in this uh, picture. And we can talk about high purchasing, purchasing power, enjoying nature, high cultural and educational level, very grateful, and looking for new experiences away from mass tourism. And these characteristics mean that wineries must focus on them in order to satisfy this type of customer. And this is where the second point comes in, wineries and wine regions. In the tourist sector, uh, there is increasing talk of experiential tourism. In it, the experiences that we have during the, the trip go beyond pure hedonism and remain in memories forever. The world of wine, with all its uh, nuances and extension, is capable of generating these experiences beyond simple wine tasting. The most basic package of a wine tourism visit often includes a wine tasting, three or four uh, simple wines, and a quick visit to the winery. We have to understand that the wine tourism sector hasn't just started, but has been going on for, for several years already, and this experience needs to be accompanied by new stimuli to, different, to differentiate it itself from the competition. For example, and focus on Spain. Let us imagine a tourist who travels to Rioja and visits a winery where the wine tourism experience is to see barrels, tanks, and to taste free wines. It can be stimulating if it's your first time, but the following year, he repeats the experience, but in Ribeira Sacra, in Galicia, the, the, the picture they have in my back. And the following year, in Sherry, Andalusia. In the end, the experience will tend to homogenize and the, that customer will lose the stimulation by the wine to the same. However, if the wine tasting in Rioja is done from a viewpoint with the sunset in a sea of vineyards, the emotional impact will be very different. And if in Galicia, the tasting is done in the vineyard, 
with a small grain grower who is able to explain how the aromas of the soil are retained in the wine and you discover the concept terroir, it's something else. And if the tasting in her head um, takes place while reading between vineyards, the experience is also different. It's all been the same from the beginning, but the small details, the staging and the context change the emotional impact of the uh, tasting. And here lies the dynamic from a wine tourism project to work and position itself in time. And each winery must adapt to must adapt it to its possibilities and give a differential value to the experience. For example, in this picture, Rioja. This is the Dinastia Vivanco Museum. Uh, do you know how many visits received this museum to the year? Seven, 70, 70 thousand visitors a year. Seventy thousand at wine museum. It's a it's a reference in the network of museum in Spain and in Europe. Okay, and this is the picture of the museum. And this picture, by the way, do you know who, uh, do you know which is the most visited winery in Europe? Is this one, Gonzalez Diaz, Tio Pepe, more than two and a half million visitors a year. Two and a half million visitors a year. And why? What is uh, the secret? To help preserve the buildings, the barrels, and the essence of Jerez for more than a century. For example, this barrel, you can read here, 1728. This is the age of the wine that is into this barrel. Of course, today is not wine, and you can taste just if you visit this winery. So this is a, a, a new tool to develop a different wine to the same. It's not just taste three or four wines. You can taste a wine with more than three centuries. Of course, if you are a friend uh, from the of the of the family. But in in the beginning, this uh, that is why it's so important to consider these two points, tourists and wineries, as well as the third wine, the enotourist experience. See this. This is a picture. The last uh, year we we traveled from Ribera del Duero, and we taste in this in this winery, uh, Viña Sastre, one of the most famous um, wineries in Ribera del Duero, and we taste with uh, Jesus the different wines that they have. Uh, one of them, uh, one is, uh, the last, the Pesus, is one of the most expensive uh, wines in Ribera del Duero. And the next year, the next day, sorry, at the morning, we taste the same wine, but in the vineyard. It's really the same. We taste here the wine in a tasting room, and in, at the morning, we taste this wine in the vineyard where the grapes come. So the experience is completely different. It's not the same. Really, we are doing the same, tasting this wine, but it's not the same in a cold tasting room than in the vineyard. Um, this is the real power of the wine to the same. Uh, talking about the enotourist uh, experience, um, as I have uh, mentioned, this experience goes far beyond the simple wine testing or the visit to the winery. For example, two years ago, we organized a wine tourism trip for about 15, 14 or 15 international journalists and wine writers. Uh, almost of them were members uh, of FIDE, who came from countries such as uh, Peru, Russia, Italy, uh, our Anne, uh, our secretary Anne, uh, Belgium, United Kingdom. During almost a week, we visited the five main wine growing uh, regions of Galicia. The journalists um, were able to taste more than 200 wines from Galicia, but they didn't visit any winery. We gave them this uh, book, the book that you, you can see here in this picture, each day. And each day we visited a different region. In the book, they can read all the wines that they will taste in this uh, journey. And um, already it wasn't necessary to visit a winery because we implement different uh, activities. The wine tourism experience that we designed explained to them better the territory and the diversity of each area than any tasting room in Ribera Sacra, like this picture or this one. In Ribera Sacra, we 
across the river, tasting the different wines and seeing the vineyards. In the back of the trip, you can in the back of the ship, you can see the vineyards. Okay, in the in the hill. Uh, can can you see here in the window? Yeah. Ah, okay, perfect. Um, in in this boat. While we watched the grape harvest in heroic viticulture, we could taste all the different wines. And in the next picture, in Val de Orras, uh, another different region, an ancient spelling a medieval monastery explained to us the secular knowledge roots that the wine has uh, in our uh, region. And in Monterey, here, we visited the ancient rock wine presses that the Romans used to make wine in the area 2,000 years ago. In the Ribeiro, the Jewish quarter explained the wine trade in Galicia for more of than 1,000 years. And in Rias Baixas, in a catamaran eating oysters and drinking Albarino, we understood the term Atlantic wine better than ever. Today's tourists are thirsty for wine tourism, but the sector shouldn't be satisfied with what is coming. They are customers with resources and very grateful, but also very demanding. The sector must be up to date and understand enotourism as an independent business from the sale of wine, also both uh, feed on each other. But uh, it's important to understand that it's another and different business. For a wine tourist project to be consolidated, it should count on professionals in charge and predetermination. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Please uh, stop sharing your screen. That all looked very, very um, promising and tasty. Uh, I, re you really, because this year I'm not traveling, so I really uh, see what I'm missing. Um, do you, uh, uh, one question to you, do you expect any uh, wine tourism visitors this year or what do you expect for the next month? Mm, I think that the wine tourism that we'll have in the next month probably will be from our land, not uh, from all the, another countries. It's possible yeah. that from Madrid or Barcelona talking about Galicia. And in Spain, it's very, very probably that the people um, go out from the coast and go to the more traditional when growing regions. Yeah, it's possible yeah. that growing up. Yeah, it is a very, very sp special year. Thank you very much, Alejandro. And I would like to know how important wine tourism is for wine producers. Natalie Said Tuma, I hope I pronounce it correctly, from Lebanon, works in the family owned wine estate Chateau St. Thomas winery in Cap Elias in the Baker Valley. Natalie is a dedicated businesswoman in various organizations, also in Lebanese League for Women in Business. Natalie, please tell us about wine tourism in your country. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Natalie Saeed Touma. I'm one of the founders and owners of Chateau Saint Touma. Uh, winery in uh, the Bikar Valley, Lebanon. Let me give you like an overview about uh, the wine uh, industry in Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon has been producing wine um, uh, for more than 6,000 years. Uh, also, Lebanon has been mentioned in the, in the Bible many, many times and the Old uh, Testament as well. We have uh, at the moment more than 40 uh, wineries. Uh, let me talk a little bit about our winery, our family, uh, our family, how we started. Hello? Yes. Yes? Yes, you can, you can carry on. It's, it's all right now. You can carry on, okay. Natalie. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the family, uh, the family business. Uh, the Tuma family um, uh, started uh, in, has been making uh, since 1888. Uh, we have uh, in Lebanon uh, the, 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 the Roman ruins. The Roman, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we, we have can. in Lebanon um, uh, uh, the, uh, a great, a great site, 
a great site. It's the Roman ruins, where the Roman uh, uh, have the temple of Bacchus. And Bacchus, of course, uh, is the, the, the god of wine. And it's not it's not very far from where uh, we have the winery. It's just 40 kilometers away from uh, from the winery. It's in the Bika, north of uh, the Bika Valley. Uh, so uh, that's that's a little bit about like uh, the history about the wine. Uh, I will continue to talk about uh, uh, the family winery. Um, uh, the Tuma family has been producing Arab since 1888. The Arab is the uh, local alcohol drink of Lebanon. It's the distillation of uh, grape. Uh, juice with uh, with aniseed, very similar to ouzo, but of course it's made out of uh, grape. The alcohol is made out of uh, out of grape. So my great grandfather, uh, the family uh, uh, generation, to continue this uh, this legacy. Um, regarding uh, Chateau Saint Thomas, uh, we started Chateau Saint Thomas in the 1990s. We brought the vines from uh, from Europe, of course. We brought uh, uh, like the Pinot Noir, uh, Merlot, Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon, Grenache. Uh, we planted them, and uh, uh, we did our first harvest or uh, vintage uh, was in uh, 1998. Um, in in 2000, we started selling the wine in Lebanon and, uh, of course, uh, uh, outside Lebanon. Uh, we have about 65 hectares of vineyards. Um, we produce uh, 450,000 bottles a year. 70% uh, of the production is for export and uh, the rest is uh, of course uh, uh, to be to, to for for the Lebanese uh, Lebanusians like in uh, Vin Expo, Pro Wine, um, lately Wine Paris, uh, London Wine Fair, um, and um, I have to say that uh, something about uh, uh, what we did. Uh, specifically with the uh, wine mosaic. Uh, my brother Joe, who's the winemaker, uh, is, is a member of the Wine Mosaic Association. And uh, what they do in Wine Mosaic, they help... Uh, Oops, you are gone, Natalie. Uh, the wine producing country to, uh, to preserve and, uh, uh, and promote the local indigenous variety of their, uh, of their country. Uh, and uh, we worked with them um, to, uh, with the uh, with Obeidi. Obeidi is um, uh, a white it's the DNA of this grape variety, and the result came out to be uh, unique. Uh, hello. Okay, I think uh, it is difficult with the connection, Can you hear me Natalie. Now? Uh, Can you hear me? For the moment, for the moment, Can, yes. Can but, you hear me? I, okay. But uh, part, partly. With the so we did the, the test, uh, the DNA test of the Obeidi, and the result turned out to be unique. Uh, it didn't resemble any international grape variety known in the world of, uh, of wine. So uh, this was uh, a proof that it's the Obeidi is, is indigenous to Lebanon, and, um, and uh, you can't find it anywhere else. 
So it was, a, it was, hello? Uh, yeah, we, we, can't, we can't really hear you anymore. Uh, so Thank the you. Obedi study was yeah. a great way, uh, the great, a great way uh, to, uh, to, to improve the honor tourism for, uh, for Lebanon because a lot of, uh, a lot of tourists uh, use the Obey. Um, uh, okay, let Okay, uh, Natalie, have, thank you very uh, much. I to talk a little bit about the wine tourism. Yes. Uh, in, uh, in the winery and what we do. Uh, oh, since, oh, uh, again, since 2000, we started organizing in the winery in Chateau Saint Thomas um, uh, a harvest, a camping harvest event um, uh, where we, we do a settings. Uh, I, can you hear me? Not, not uh, really. I, I think, a, I think uh, we, where we, we organize uh, yeah. a camping event. Uh, we invite the families and uh, and friends to come and spend the weekend with uh, with us. Uh, the idea was to uh, to get people uh, get more closer uh, to nature, to earth, uh, and as well to to um, uh, is a cultural event to to show them, uh, to introduce them to wine, wine tasting. I invite you all to come join us in Lebanon to, to visit us and uh, uh, to taste our wine. Thank That's you. very kind. Thank you very much, Natalie. Okay, that was Natalie Saituma you... from Lebanon. Thank you very much. Oh. And um, Italy is definitely the country <laughs> where you could imagine wine tourism was invented. Also, the idea for this uh, talk today came from FISHEF member. Filippo Magnani. Filippo lives in Florence and he is a wine travel expert and wine writer. He runs a wine blog, travel blog, and he has specialized in wine tours in Italy since more than 20 years. Filippo, please share your Italian experience with us. Ciao, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the Fijev and all members who joined the, the talk. And of course, I would like to share with my bad English this uh, uh, presentation on one side. On the other side, I only made my university in Florence, but I live on the Tuscan coast. Actually, I am on Elba Islands, where I live in Sarma. So it's a very nice uh, area also for wine tasting and wine traveling. But anyway, uh, I would like to go and share with you, uh, go ahead and share with you my presentation, if you don't mind. Uh, basically, um, is what I do for 20 years is organizing wine and food tours. Uh, I start in Tuscany, but then I spread out all through Italy. And uh, as you know, as you said, Wolfgang, in the last uh, 20 years, uh, uh, I saw a big evolution of wine tourism in Italy. From north to south, from the Alps to the Sicily, Every winery is, or almost every winery is from biggest uh, to the smallest, uh, from the more modern to the most uh, ancient. Uh, uh, they have been ready and prepared for welcoming uh, visitors uh, and uh, uh, welcoming uh, wine lovers. Uh, but of course, uh, 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 with the pandemic, uh, we had uh, an outbreak, we had a kind of uh, block uh, on even on wine tourism. So basically, um, uh, the winery, and uh, in the last 20, uh, sorry, in the last two months, uh, I had the chance to talk with many wineries, with many, when many wine uh, consortium, wine association. Uh, they, are no, they are now trying to face the new challenges in terms of short term for 2020 and medium long term to, to, from 2021 ahead. And of course, uh, on do, uh, saying this, I would like to put, uh, to bring your attention of what today Italian wineries are trying to, uh, of uh, remodeling uh, their proposal in terms of uh, hospitality. Of course, as everybody knows, uh, the board of in between Italy and with, uh, between Europe, they have uh, reopened it 
we are welcome we are start to, uh, to receive the first uh, international travelers i mean more european travelers but i hope uh, in between uh, september october even uh, uh, long distance travelers as uh, brazilians here they are here we they are represented uh, north european north uh, north americans canadian Can Can uh, canadian but also Asians and of course uh, one is in Italy of uh, as uh, Alejandro as everybody who are who have uh, talked before me they are following nationals regional but also um, precise uh, precise uh, wine tourism uh, guidelines um, uh, of course everybody is trying to man uh, uh, to maintain physical distance uh, to maintain safety and uh, you know to assure the assurance the, the safety of uh, visitors because of course uh, uh, wineries they are uh, they are ready to welcome visitors uh, from now ahead so on the left side uh, italian wineries they try to develop uh, or to enhance the quality and the um, um, uh, engagement of what they have done until now so the real Uh, the real visit uh, at the winery, so with the person uh, who are uh, real, uh, real, uh, real alive uh, uh, at the wineries. Uh, so tasting, as everybody said before, tasting lunch and dinners, barrel tasting, blending games. Uh, we, there is uh, an open, uh, a, a more or, a, or organization uh, um, toward the open air experiences like picnic uh, and, uh, and wine and tours in the vineyards. But um, I think uh, what uh, the pandemic has obliged uh, uh, Italian wineries, uh, which were a little bit behind it, uh, toward uh, the Western world, uh, like for example, France, uh, even Spain, but also I think I'm talking about uh, Napa Valley wineries, uh, is go toward the, the, the digitalization in terms of the use of devices for in at the wineries but also for letting people for letting the wine uh, the wine lovers uh, to is to have easy access uh, with more safety of course but also with more engagement at the, during the wine the winery visit and uh, for, for example there are many wineries uh, they have try, they are trying to enlarge the wi-fi not only at the winery in the wine tasting room but also around the winery in the vineyard for example and uh, the even uh, the re some others they release uh, the, uh, some uh, of their uh, um, uh, own uh, branded uh, technical devices to the uh, wine uh, travelers Uh, for example, like uh, hypo, uh, like uh, hy um, iPad uh, or, or phone, uh, which can be used only at the winery for engagement, uh, for taking photo, for taking, uh, you know, engaging more people. Um, one other things that they are trying to do is uh, to um, uh, to give more emphasis on geolocalization, how people they can easily find the wineries in all through Italy, even the hidden place. And this is very important for nowadays. Of course, uh, when we talk about uh, digital devices, the use of uh, digital, we, we cannot mention, we, we, are, we, we have to mention the use of uh, uh, live streaming at the wineries like we are doing today. Uh, so uh, the digital uh, wine tasting, the use of the digital, the different use, uh, the, dif the different objectives that, that wineries are, um, um, are, they are trying to achieve with the use of uh, the, the new wine tasting, the new way of wine tasting. Uh, and also I would like to point it out uh, the use, uh, the, they try also to implement uh, some uh, app uh, Uh, which are trying to uh, as reassure in terms of the security, but also uh, customer traveling assistance, uh, the, the travelers, even domestic travelers like Italian or international travelers. So this is uh, something general what they uh, what they the the, the winery are are trying. But if we look at more uh, in terms of how they try to sell or promote uh, 
uh, the, their uh, wine experience uh, and they, they try to develop the hospitality at their, pro at the, at their property, uh, there is a, a, new, a new approach again. You know, uh, nowadays uh, we can really split uh, how to book a wine traveler, uh, a wine travel experience uh, in two different families. Family. Speak. Sorry. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, everything is ah, fine. Okay. In two different sectors, in two different categories. On your left side, you have more the traditional approach. Uh, customers uh, like wine enthusiasts, uh, wine collectors, wine club, more, a little bit more, you know, selected people who are very keen to travel all through the world uh, in different wine destinations, who are still use, uh, who are still uh, uh, keen to use a, a specific travel agency, a travel, wine travel operator to organize uh, their trip. Here, for example, I see in our panel, people like uh, Omero, Aguinaldo, who, are, who have been organizing some tours with me, and I'm very honored to have, the, to have, to have uh, those them uh, like friends, but also as, uh, as uh, organizer. On the, on, the, on, the, on, the, um, on the right side, anyway, there is uh, more and more the use uh, of uh, the habits to buy a, a wine experience, a wine travel experience, a wine tasting, through the so-called uh, marketplaces. Those are platforms uh, they, uh, they, they present uh, and they um, propose uh, uh, the booking and also the buying uh, through uh, the, some engine, like a uh, little bit like uh, booking.com. Here I gave you some example. There are some wineries, there is an international English company, winetourism.com is another one. Wine Around is more specialized for Italy. So those uh, are very uh, popular right now. I would say if I really had to, uh, to make a difference, uh, those are uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the aim of those uh, platform probably is to enlarge uh, to the panel of our so-called regular wine lovers the early drinking people, people who are very keen to use, uh, uh, for example, young people who are very use, uh, very keen to use uh, devices even to, to buy a hotel room uh, or to book uh, a guide. In this case, uh, those platforms are getting very, very popular. So I think uh, uh, from, from the point of view at the winery, but even from the point of view of uh, clients and consumer, we will see in Italy, but I think also outside Italy, many different approaches how to propose, sell, and buy uh, a wine experience. This is uh, I want just I want just to give you uh, a, a few uh, things how one of those uh, uh, wine uh, those platform uh, uh, work. People they can really uh, book uh, to a click. Uh, at the hotel reception if they already arrive in a wine destination or through their app or through their uh, booking bottom uh, the winery visit so uh, there are some benefits and some weaknesses of using uh, those uh, items uh, even for the wineries probably uh, um, at the end uh, we can say that uh, i think uh, uh, you know um, um, more and more, sorry, more and more the future of wine tourism even uh, we will be uh, on digital uh, innovation. But at the end, uh, I think uh, it's certainly true that the behind a wine tour, a visit experience, uh, there is a need of uh, professionalism, uh, equality, uh, quality and personalization. I think people uh, who of course uh, come and travel uh, as us, uh, all of us, Usually in a wine country, they need to have a person who is a specialized in wine, who need producer, who, who know producer, who know the territories, who know how the to how to organize uh, a proper uh, wine travel. So I, I don't say that uh, one uh, one of the category or one of the approach is better for the for the other, but I think we will be more and more be use, uh, using uh, those multi-channel multi uh, approach of uh, um, um, making business or making 
uh, experiences or creating exposure in a travel, uh, in a wine travel global uh, market. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much, Filippo. Quite fascinating. Uh, I think Italy is well advanced in digital wine tourism. I'm quite impressed. I didn't know that. Well, well done. Well, I, I, you know, people is like people, uh, Italian savoir faire. Once we got the problem, we need to sort it out some way. <laughs> and they, we are trying to, you know, to implement this kind of approach, uh, uh, even looking to other countries. I know that uh, many wineries, for example, again, in, uh, in the north of uh, America, in Napa Valley, in uh, Russian River, they are doing a lot of these, uh, booking uh, online for many years already. So I am not saying, I, of course I am in part personally in, involved uh, in a personalization crafted uh, and uh, customization of wine tours. But I think we need also to be aware that there is also another way to, to present the wine travel. Definitely, thank you very much. So you heard uh, all our four speakers and um, now it's up to the participants to uh, ask questions. Please tell us your name, your profession, and where you are coming from when you do ask your question. So it's all open now for all participants. Wonderful presentations from everyone. This is a great way of doing things. I, I liked all the presentations, and I thought also I agreed with Filippo, Italy doing everything digitally. I'm working on my thesis for millennials responding to wine. Does anybody have any tips of how to attract the millennial generation to their regions? Well, if I want to respond, those are some of, uh, I try with my the presentation, this slide uh, pitch that I present to you today is based on some research and thesis uh, that Bocconi University, which is one of the highest, uh, the high-end uh, economic university in Italy from Milan, has made a uh, few years ago based uh, on wine to luxury wine tourism for millennials and uh, Generation Z, Z. So Generation Z. So I think uh, I have plenty of uh, information to give to you. I just want just to thank uh, to to underline that of course the new if we if we want to talk about luxury luxury tourism and I'm not talking about only in terms of money but in terms of experience luxury experience no money only money people young people so millennials and generation Z especially Asians will we, we will we, they will book more and more online so we need to find a, a really a compromise between their needs and what is a, a personalization of wine tours. But anyway, I can, Marisa, I can give so many others information about. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. We have a question from uh, Per Carlson to all of the speakers. When do you think wine tourism will return to relatively normal levels towards the end of this year, or will it take longer? For us Canadians and Americans, uh, it's got to do with air travel for safety. Um, the, I see from the Americans coming to Europe I, I, and other parts of the world, it's got to do with the airlines and safety. And I, I don't see anticipated anything this year. I, I would say starting next year, Okay, so Alejandro, what do you think? I, yeah, uh, I think that uh, it depends a lot of the, depending on the country and the, the COVID-19. In Spain, for example, I think that in the next uh, two, three or four months, the wine tourism will uh, growing up, grow up uh, because it's a very interesting alternative to the coast and the summer and beach uh, tourism that today has more risk than to visit a winery or the vineyard. So uh, maybe mm, it will be a very, very interesting um, option uh, for the tourists in the next uh, months. So I think that the wine tourism will um, increase in the next months and maybe we can keep this um, this, uh, this, these numbers for the next year. If people will enjoy 
people will come back again. I can answer it for uh, Germany. Uh, I think uh, usually in autumn we have a lot of wine celebrations, uh, some of them with hundreds of thousands of people, and they're all cancelled for this year uh, because it's just not possible to organize them. The wine estates are open, so you can go there and taste uh, um, your wine. But to be honest, we don't expect anything to happen until summer next year, because um, before that, I don't think we have, will have a, a kind uh, of normality as uh, we do expect. I agree too. Uh, I think the problem will be, first of all, uh, if we are... Uh, sir. Sorry? If we are talking about uh, lo uh, local or national tourism, or if we are co uh, uh, talking about tourists coming from abroad. Local tourism, people are going away and going out on during the week small trips but they are beginning so it will be a summer where people will be uh, going around not far uh, but still local and national tourism probably it will be a way also of uh, rediscovering something that is not so far from you and I think to add uh, Alejandro and Filippo and even uh, Liz that the international tourism will be coming back next year definitely because it's not during the winter, uh, it's not during uh, August here with 45 degrees that people are going around in the, in the vineyards. Huh? It will be from, uh, let's say, the end of March to the end of June. And then in September, obviously. I agree with everybody that the local tourism will pick up for the moment. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Lebanon. A lot, a lot of people are, um, are, are, are tired of the lockdown and, and uh, they really want to go out uh, even to the winery to do tour, um, wine tasting. Thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us and thank you uh, Mr. Wolfgang. And thank you, Anne. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, all the participants. Thank you, uh, all the speakers. I learned quite a lot today. So I learned a lot about Canada, with wine in Canada, that I have no experience about that. And I learned that uh, in Spain, there is a wine estate with 2.5 million visitors. Very impressive. I didn't know that either. And... Um, they have uh, movies and wine in Lebanon that I didn't know as well. And I'm quite impressed about the online wine booking platforms about wine tourism in Italy. That was our first FIJEF wine talk. Um, and um, it is part of the program of FIJEF that FIJEF goes digital because I think there's no alternative to that. Um, I'm sorry that we couldn't hear Partly, probably, um, um, uh, Natalie from Lebanon, but um, that can happen. And uh, I'm quite convinced that we will continue this uh, FIJF wine talk. We have such a lot of qualified members, and you all are qualified to be speakers, to be presenters. And whoever comes across with an idea, please send uh, an email to me. And if you have a subject, and we establish the next FIJF Wine Talk, perhaps with you or you or you as a speaker or as a presenter. Um, I thank you. I thank today all our speakers, Liz Palmer from Canada, Alejandro Paidin from Spain, Natalie Saituma from Lebanon and Filippo Magnani from Salute. Italy. Salute. Yes, thank I'll you. <laughs> and thank all the participants for your patience. And uh, we have taped this um, FIJEF Wine Talk, and we will add it on our YouTube FIJEF Wine channel. And I hope you are subscribers because we still need six uh, subscribers for our FIJEF Wine channel. Four, only four, only four. Okay, and we only need four more subscribers, and then we have the right to use our name. So I think that's for now. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Enjoy your, the warm evening and uh, enjoy a glass of wine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, Filippo, can, can you can you share? Oh, okay. Ciao. Ciao a tutti. Ciao. Ciao.